Welcome to Open Minds Radio with Alejandro Rojas. Open Minds Radio is your UFO news authority, presenting evidence and the latest news regarding the UFO phenomenon. Here's your host, Alejandro Rojas. Hello and welcome to Open Minds Radio, your UFO news authority. This is Alejandro Rojas. And we have a very special show for you today. Not that every show isn't special and wonderful and fabulous. Um, I don't know how we do it, to be quite frank, how we keep up the great quality of the show. But we do. We find a way to do it amongst all of our other crazy work. Uh, Busy, busy all day long to get you guys the latest and the best information on a daily basis. And today I am excited to say we have Joseph McMonagle. And what's so exciting about this? He was the very first remote viewer. So some of you are very familiar with remote viewing. And this was essentially what had happened was the government had found out that the Russians, and this was back in the 70s, were using psychics to figure information out. So what they decided to do was to do this themselves so and see if they could figure it out. So they went and they found uh, the best psychic uh, they could find, and that was a gentleman by the name of Ingo Swan. Ingo then worked with the Stanford Research Institute and the Army to develop uh, what they called remote remote viewing, which is protocols uh, for these guys to be able to see things that, of course, are very far, such as submarines in Russia and stuff like that. So they did develop this, and then they tested people. Uh, McMonagle will talk about this, uh, the testing that he went through to become a remote viewer, and he became the very first And he did this for many years, and he'll talk about how accurate they were. And one interesting note, if you've uh, read up on this, uh, there's Jim Marr's book, Psy Spies, is a good one, talks about the history. But also, uh, Joseph McMonagall himself has written uh, several books, and he'll talk about that. But a lot of the remote viewers, uh, purposefully or not purposefully, had seen... uh, UFOs when they remote viewed so they remote viewed UFOs extraterrestrial stuff like that very interesting stuff and it's incredible how just about I think everything I've read about remote viewers every single one of them whether they were skeptic about the subject before or not remote viewed UFOs Uh, so that's really cool so we'll talk to him about the information he got he's going to be speaking at MUFON in July and we're going to be there too that's July 29th through the 31st in Irvine California You can find out more at MUFON.com, but that's going to be a fun event, and Joe and uh, uh, some of these other people are going to be speaking there, so uh, that's going to be some good stuff. And you can come meet us. Come buy some magazines, talk to us about the magazine, hang out, give us a high five, or tell me, hey man, that story you wrote about XYZ sucked, man. Whatever you want to talk about, come talk to us. What we're so busy doing on a regular basis of course it's getting you the ufo news and on our our website you can get the the latest and greatest uh on a regular uh all the time so and there's always something going on and every week on the show we bring on our news correspondent jason mcclellan to talk to us about some of that news jason let's talk some ufo news buddy thank you alejandro this is your open minds news brief for monday june 6th 2011 on may 26 the abc news news program called nightline featured a confrontation between annie jacobson the author of the controversial book about area 51 that is still making worldwide headlines and abc reporter bill weir in her book jacobson claims that an anonymous source told her that ufo parts recovered from the 1947 roswell crash were actually from an advanced german aircraft and that bodies recovered were actually children that had been mutilated by Joseph Mengele, the infamous Nazi physician who had performed gruesome human experiments during World War II. The anonymous source further stated that Joseph Stalin had flown this craft over the U.S. and with mangled children in order to trick the Americans into thinking this was a spacecraft flown by extraterrestrials inciting a mass panic similar to the one caused by the airing of the radio program The War of the Worlds. Jacobs arranged to have Weir talk to this anonymous witness. However, Weir says the witness told him that he did not make all of the claims laid out in the book and described the gentleman as, in his late 80s, it seemed obviously confused and conflicted. 
Yeah, I don't. We're of course very used to this in the UFO world, talking to witnesses who claim some extraordinary things, but of course not seeming to be completely with it themselves. I would imagine since she's been a journalist for that's the thing for so long. She probably knows better, and Weir was kind of telling her that. You know, you know better. This isn't journalism. So it looks like she might have been just adding that whole kind of cherry on top just to sensationalize her book. And it worked because she sure did get a lot of uh, coverage. It certainly seems that way, and it's really unfortunate. But, yeah, the ABC did a really good job of kind of calling her out. Mm -hmm. Washington Post, I mean, really bashed her on the fundamentals of the claim, how it doesn't make sense or, you know, if, if this was an extraordinary craft, you know, where is this technology now? And it's interesting because uh, he even s mentioned how the witness, uh, Annie Jacobson's witness said, oh, yeah, well, we have this stuff. We have hover stuff and everything like that, which, of course, um, he's saying was developed from some of this. And so... Uh, they really kind of took the whole argument apart, regardless of now the credibility of the witness, which himself doesn't seem like he accurately remembers things either. Right. And you put that in an article, and we also have the, the video on our website of that ABC interview. So check that out at openminds.tv. In Worth other news, watching. oh yeah. In other news, three fast-moving lights in the sky above Oakland, California were captured on video on May 26th. As the Daily Mail reported, the video was uploaded to YouTube by the witness who also captured similar lights in the sky in May and June of 2010. In the May 26 video, the lights move in a tight triangle formation through the night sky at 9.40 p.m. The witness who recorded the night vision video describes the lights as a UFO squadron. But based on the video, it's difficult to determine if the three lights are from one object or from three independent objects. Some who have viewed the video have suggested the objects in the sky might be a flock of birds. According to the Daily Mail, the witness has responded, For all you bird lovers out there, you can call them geese if you like, but I will only laugh at you. But we and, and others have, have looked at uh, different video. There actually, you can go on our website and see video of flocks of birds flying in the sky. And this is kind of interesting, Alejandro. I mean, birds at night through night vision look very interesting in the sky, mm -hmm. but they don't tend to keep this tight triangle pattern that this particular video shows. Yeah, I mean, we posted, one of the videos we posted are some birds in a triangular or in a formation and they fly somewhat together. They're, they're more of in a line. Um, it's, I think, very, very slight. I can't shut the door on this latest video being birds because I, I you know, the, it's a really tight formation and they're all moving together, which I don't see how birds could do that. But uh, because of that other video being slightly similar, maybe not. I don't know. But, but you brought up some good points mm -hmm. that there are other lights in this video in addition to the tight triangle formation. Yeah. And these lights don't just move together in a group. One was stationary and then started moving in a direction. Oh, yeah. Those were the Ed Grimsley ones. Right, right, right. Yeah. Now, and right, exactly. When you look at these bird ones, Ed Grimsley's, his were uh, blown off by MSNBC as being birds by this Radford and, and that, who works for Skeptical Inquirer and someone else from Skeptical Inquirer. But right, one's sitting there perfectly still, then it takes off. One is going in a direction, slows down, and turns completely around. I mean, it, it's here again, doesn't look like birds. And then the older one, the one from Fresno in, or uh, Fremont in 2008, that is five lights in a perfect formation. Definitely not birds. So, I mean, these could be some kind of secret aircraft or something like that, but uh, they're much, much more interesting and intriguing than especially the skeptic for MSNBC keeps putting on. If you haven't done it, I highly recommend either getting or borrowing night vision equipment and checking out the sky at night. Mm -hmm. There's some cool stuff going on up in the sky. You yep. see a lot of weird stuff. I've seen a lot. You see so many satellites and, you know, with some of them, it's hard to follow these things. So you have to get experience. I've seen things zooming around really fast. I haven't seen anything do like a right angle or, 
or a turn or anything like that, but that's typically because I lose them fairly quickly because I don't have one myself, so it's usually borrowing one. I need to... Well, and I mentioned before, I've, I actually mm -hmm. have gone out with Ed Grimsley on one of his night watches and have seen these things that do the right angles and the going mm -hmm. in one direction, stop, and then go another direction. I have no idea what it is, but it's, it's amazing to watch. So. It's incredible. I think this is where a breakthrough can come. If people get out there with their night vision and take enough video like Grimsley and like these other two gentlemen, and you get that in front of the experts, I mean, I think they'd be hard-pressed to come up with answers. I think people tend to be a little, a little too, not lazy, but, you know, rely on what other people have told us. We mentioned this with mm -hmm. NASA, how every week NASA seems to figure oh, something right. new out that they that we all always thought they knew it was going on, but they have no idea. They're mm -hmm. all, oh, there are all these giant planets zooming around with no orbit. Well, yeah. you know, more people need to pick up their tel their own telescopes, their own night vision equipment, and look at the sky for themselves because there's all sorts of crazy things going on that we have no idea about and nobody's telling us about them. Yep. So. In other news, Stephen Greer, founder of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, has been charged in connection with allegedly operating a commercial venture on a national wildlife refuge according to the Outer Banks Sentinel, and is scheduled to appear before the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of North Carolina next month. Greer has been leading ambassador training courses for nearly a decade, which are week-long intensive courses designed to prepare individuals for making peaceful contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. These training courses have been held at a National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina for the past four years, and because of this, Greer is being charged with the operation of a commercial enterprise on a National Wildlife Refuge trespassing on a national wildlife refuge and violation of daylight use only regulation which pro prohibits all nighttime activities on Pea Island except fishing. No permit was obtained by Greer or the organization to conduct, conduct business on the wildlife refuge. But as a spokesperson from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service told the Outer Banks Sentinel, we don't allow and would not permit non-wildlife dependent commercial recreation activities thus would not likely issue a permit for a UFO program, commercial or otherwise. Yeah, we got a response from uh, CSETI directly uh, uh, that we posted. And I kind of feel bad for him because it sounds like they got bad information. That um, they were told by someone who used to work for the park that uh, that person had secured the right permits uh, and gotten the right permissions right but that person actually hadn't and they trusted that person so i feel bad because they trusted this person at the same time they charge a thousand dollars a head for these things so they probably should have checked with the park themselves to clear this stuff uh but it doesn't seem right that and i don't think that that fish and wildlife person was accurate and that they don't allow people to do anything in the land that isn't wildlife related uh, yeah i think you're right with that but it is interesting that they seem to have a daylight only regulation as well. Hmm. And obviously sky watching would be at night. Yeah. So if they forbid all night activities as well, it's interesting how people were able to get on the land anyway. Yeah, that's well, most parks are like that where they have a sign up that says you can't be here after dark. That's true. Um, that's true. And I've done this. I've organized these sky watches, and usually you have to go and you have to get permission. And some places won't let you, and some places will. But yeah, the, the quotes that they they provided from the officials seem like they were kind of discriminating against the, the yeah. against UFO people because they said, "Really, it doesn't matter. Um, we wouldn't give you a permit anyway." So yeah, that's not cool. Not cool at all. Well. I know you like movies, Alejandro, and I know you're looking forward to this one. Super 8 is being hyped up through a variety of marketing efforts. A Super 8 iPhone application was released last month that lets you create your own vintage movies with the Super 8 cam camera emulator. And if that weren't cool enough, Paramount Pictures and the convenience store chain 7-Eleven have announced a Super 8 promotion that will be giving away a trip to space. 7-Eleven Chief Marketing Officer Rita Bargerhoff explained that the Super 8 promotion saying not only will there be special prizes and a retro look from the 1970s at the stores in honor of the movie, this promotion will rank as the largest ever for 7-Eleven with an expected 21,000 prizes distributed. Topping it off will be a suborbital space flight, our grandest prize ever. Even if you don't win the, the grand prize of a space flight, they are still giving away 10 zero-gravity trips in cooperation with the company Space Adventure. 
Super 8 hits theaters this Friday. And Alejandro, there you go. Your 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 dream is there. You can go to space. Yes. All I have to do is drink Slurpees. I need to go get my Slurpee cup anyways. I was really excited with the, the Simpsons movie when they did this. I still have my Slurpee Simpsons cups when oh, they yeah. made them Quickie Marts. Uh, we had one of those in Denver, a 7-Eleven that was a Quickie Mart for a few weeks. Right. So, yeah, pretty exciting. And what if you go on this space trip? I'd imagine it's the Virgin Galactic one where the, cause they're the most, they're closest to being ready where you just kind of go up into space and come back. But I that'd uh, be a lot of fun. The I'm zero gravity sure. one, I'm not so sure about. Yeah, you know, I, I take it, but more excited about the suborbital flight. Yeah, totally. But I, I don't think they've announced a partner for that. The only partner they announced for any of the space stuff was uh, Space Adventures, which is, you know, a space tourism company. And they do these these zero-G flights right now, but I think yeah. they're one of the companies that's working on yeah. taking people into space. So Yeah, they're working on it, um, but some of these others, I think they're the ones who are hooking up with the Russians, aren't they? Yes. To do the $150 million ones. Right. That'd be cool. You go spend time on the space station, get blown up there by the Russians. Yeah. That'd but be even, a lot of fun. Even cooler is getting this uh, free ride through 7-Eleven. <laughs> yep. It's the way to go. Uh, Paramount Pictures announced on Thursday that it acquired the rights to make an animated adaptation of the Penny Arcade online comic strip, The New Kid. The Escapist explains that the plot of the New Kid comic strip is centered around a boy and his father talking about how they are constantly forced to move from planet to planet by his father's job, making the boy a constant new kid at school. In addition to New Kid, Paramount is also distributing the upcoming extraterrestrial-related movies Super 8 and Transformers Dark of the Moon, and is also scheduled to dis distribute Paranormal Activity 3, a Star Trek sequel, and a movie about Area 51. So Paramount Pictures seems to be very into the topic, but uh, I guess this, this isn't a, a fantastically new theme concept for a movie, but... You know, and it's a, it's an, a, again, an E.T. movie geared towards children. It's about a, a boy who is the new kid in school, but the school is a school filled with, uh, a classroom filled with extraterrestrials. So instead of a lot of the movies geared towards children and everybody else that we watch where a lone extraterrestrial comes to Earth, this has the Earthling being the lone human on a different planet. Mm -hmm. So again, more, more extraterrestrial theme movies targeted towards children yeah but a that's been i trend. mean there's all kinds of i don't think it's a growing trend necessarily there's tons of cartoons for for a long time that have been around extraterrestrials a good portion of the cartoons out there if you go watch and go see the cartoons have aliens in them or are alien related um it's definitely a genre that's huge when it comes to cartoons right Yes, and you have uh, you and I have had this conversation. We talked about Marvin the Martian and other things. Yeah. So you you are right. It's been implanted in my brain since I was a, a wee lad. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, there was we have a, a cool photo from from this past week. A man who recently was vacationing in the outskirts of Kunming, China, accidentally photographed a UFO. He says he snapped two photos of the scenery, and later when he was reviewing the shots later that night, he noticed three black dots hovering above the Songhua Dam in the photos. He thought the largest dot looked like a butterfly. Becoming UFO Research Society President uh, Zhang Yifang ruled out the, that it was a butterfly. He stated it has a saucer shape of a UFO. I believe it is a UFO, but I can't confirm anything yet with just one photograph. That's kind of a fun photo from last week. Yeah, it's pretty background, too. It is. It's a very nice photo, and he's right. I mean, you look at it, and it does sort of look like a butterfly, one of those. Yeah, usually I say, you know, especially if people don't see it, um, typically it's a bird or or, a, or something or a bug because, you know, you don't they zip by, and you don't think anything of it. That or something they created. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That... that is one of the red flags we've talked about that before when mm -hmm. people say oh i didn't notice it when i took the picture but yeah. i was reviewing it later and noticed this mysterious dot but you never know but I mean, you never know i've yeah. done that myself in a lot of photos mm -hmm. you go back and look you're all what is that yeah or more often you take a picture of you and your friends and in the background there's a weirdo with a weird face and you're all well who's that guy in my photo <laughs> yeah that's in all the photos i take of you alejandro mm -hmm. who's that guy 
Uh, well, in a continuing trend of government uh, X-Files, it's been a hot topic, all these governments with their X-Files. A lot of files have been released this year. Well, apparently uh, not Australia. Their X-Files have gone missing. According to the Sydney Morning, Morning Herald, the Australian Department of Defense has lost its X-Files. The Herald reportedly sought to obtain files from the Department of Defense relating to UFOs via a Freedom of Information request. But after two months of searching, the department was unable to locate the files. The Herald reports that the department's FOI assistant director informed them that only one file could be located and the others had been destroyed. Another UFO file showed up in the system, but again, the FOI assistant director informed the Herald that the files could not be located and Headquarters Air Command formally advised that this file is deemed lost. Like in several other countries, Defense officials in Australia in investigated and kept records of UFO sightings for decades. The Royal Australian Air Force, the RAAF, was charged with investigating UFOs, or UAS, unusual aerial sightings, reports. A according to department memo, this function ceased in 1996 after consideration of the scientific record suggesting that there was no compelling reason for the RAAF to continue to devote resources to the recording and investigation of UAS. Department of Defense heads decided to stop taking UFO sightings reports in November of 2000, according to the Sydney World Morning Herald. Lost the files. That's fishy. Yeah, and I didn't get to read a whole lot about this, but I think one of the reasons, and you can correct me because you probably read more, that they know these files were there is because one researcher had seen the files. Right. And w in the past as part of his job or something. So they knew that they existed at some point. You're right. Some people had seen uh, these files that have gone missing, and even some, like the person said, were indicated in the system. But when they went to go to get the file from where the system was telling them that the files lived, there was no file. Hmm. Yeah, that's awfully suspicious. That's very interesting. Maybe that was Australia's way to just deal with the subject. We don't have to answer any questions if we just lose the files. Filed in the shredder. Yeah. And one last bit of news, Alejandro. This was uh, something that just came out today. There are rumors, and you probably heard these rumors, that uh, during a special screening of E.T. the Extraterrestrial at the White House in 1982, Ronald Reagan made a comment about everything in the movie being true. Well, those rumors have now been confirmed by the film's maker, Steven Spielberg. In an interview with Ain't It Cool News that was published today, Spielberg was asked about the Reagan rumors, to which he replied, he just stood up and looked around the room, almost like he was doing a head count, and he said, I want to thank you for bringing E.T. to the White House. We really enjoyed your movie. And then he looked around the room and said, and there are a number of people in this room who know that everything on that screen is absolutely true. Spielberg went on to say, I'm a little bit of a ufologist. I was hoping that there was something more to the joke than met the eye. I'm sorry to say, I think he was simply trying to tell a joke. Yeah, that's really... And you know what's funny with this story, too? I'm so excited about this story because I've always been curious about this rumor. It's just been a rumor, so uh, you kind of put it on the back burner. Um, I know Grant Cameron of PresidentialUFO.com had gotten a letter from a friend who spoke to a friend of Spielberg's who said that he uh, confirmed it with Spielberg, but still that's kind of third hand. Uh, so it's really exciting to not only get it firsthand because we have the transcript like you just read from, but if you go to our site, uh, the guy at uh, Ain't It Cool News also uh, put up the audio recording so you can hear Spielberg talking about it and his excitement about this whole event. So it's really cool. This is just, uh, I think... For me, this is really exciting. I love the Spielberg stuff, and the idea of getting to talk to him about UFOs and everything is just so exciting to me. Right, and we've all known that you know he definitely has an interest in the subject because mm -hmm. the majority of his films and, and television projects and everything deal with the subject, but to hear him refer to himself as a ufologist is kind of interesting too. Yeah, that's really cool because he's been so elusive, right. especially lately, um, about uh, his belief in ufos when it was obvious and well I, he's always dodged this this rumor too yeah yeah so it's great to hear uh finally you know what's going on and then this whole 
uh, was it real or was it not is um, was it a joke or was it not I mean it's kind of exciting too because what if it wasn't he said he was straight lipped he just said it straight so he couldn't tell if it was a joke or not but everybody laughed and he let him believe it was a joke so um, it's, it's definitely interesting and what was really funny too is later on and I thought oh here we're going to get to the meat of it because he said he did get a one on one with Nancy and Ronald and then they did whisper something to him but it was just Ronald Reagan saying why do the credits on the movies have to be so long they should be can't shorter. they just be 15 seconds <laughs> yeah it's pretty funny yeah really funny well, just one of the great stories, one of the many great stories from this last week, and you can read all about them on our website, openminds.tv, your source for UFO-related news. And that is it for the news for today. I'm your Open Minds News correspondent, Jason McClellan, and you've been briefed. Back to you, Alejandro. Thank you, Jason. That's right. We have so many exciting stories on the website, and uh, I just was really happy with today's story about Spielberg. And, of course, you can go to our site and read about it, listen to the audio, and then we have a link back to uh, presidentialufo.com where he has a lot of information about Reagan and UFOs. And we also have a link to a great story that Antonio wrote uh, on our own website, which is actually a great summary of uh, Reagan and his UFO sightings and, and his beliefs and stuff like that. So a lot of information on all of this on our website. And even more exciting is in our upcoming issue of the magazine, Open Minds Magazine, we have a little blurb on Hollywood and UFOs. We've got an article from Jason on all this Hollywood and UFO stuff. Obviously, you can see he's excited about this subject. But we also talk about Dan Aykroyd, Spielberg, um, Shirley MacLaine, and Jackie Gleason. So, And we have a special photo that we received from the Ronald Reagan Library that I really wanted to use in... Uh, the web today but I didn't because we're saving it for an exclusive for the magazine which is coming out and then of course it's from the Reg Reagan library so once it's out everybody will have it and it'll be all over the web but it's it's pretty fun otherwise you can come see those videos that we talked about the one from Fremont uh, Grimsley's at Grimsley's video and all these other uh, night vision videos in our story about uh, the media shining light on night vision UFO videos and then several videos of birds even one that does look similar to some of these so you can kind of determine for yourself and thank you to those people who are out there getting night vision of birds because it's always helpful to get video of things that could be UFOs so we can determine whether they are or not and of course on everything else that we talked about you can uh, read all about that too however we've got a long interview with uh, Joseph McMonagall remote viewer number one so let's go ahead and talk to Joe I am very happy to have Joe McMonagall on the show. Thank you very much for being here. Hello, Alejandro. I'm glad to be here. Yep, and uh, one of the reasons we have you on is for the MUFON Symposium coming up here uh, real soon. So are you excited for that? Yeah, I'm uh, finishing up my presentation as we speak, in fact. I'm very excited about coming out. This will be my second trip and the second time that I presented at the MUFON conference, and it's... Uh, it's a lot of fun. I've always enjoyed being out there for it. Yeah, there should be a big crowd, so uh, it's going to be pretty exciting. Uh-huh. What are you going to focus your talk on? Well, there's a number of things I'm going to touch on. Uh, predominantly, I'm going to be touching on what we can expect uh, in what we can expect in reality to to be confronted with uh, in a full-on uh, communications with uh, an alien uh, species and uh, I want to talk quite a bit about uh, why I think we've probably already met these aliens and uh, the meaning behind some of the things that have been going on uh, in the alien arena okay. um, that kind of thing great yeah that sounds really exciting um, and in fact you know I think maybe we'll touch on that in a little bit, but I was thinking of going back in history, kind of going back to how this all started for you. And uh, I think you, what you were traveling the world, uh, uh, going all over the place in the Army. 
Uh, is that correct? And then that, that's correct. Uh, ba basically, uh, I actually had a uh, uh, a UFO experience in my my first assignment in the Army. I was in Army intelligence, and uh, my first assignment was a Luthra in the Bahamas. I know it sounds like a pretty tough place to be assigned, but uh, <laughs> I, I dutiful, dutifully went went to the Bahamas for 18 months and uh, served on a Luthra. And in that period of time, I uh, had an incident uh, with my uh, with the guy I worked with, uh, a man by the name of Stephen Roberts, and uh, he and I were uh, were basically illuminated by a, uh, a UFO over some sand dunes one night. Uh, during that during that experience, we were both uh, kind of framed in a very bright light, coming off the uh, underside of a very large UFO, hovering at about 1,200 feet, and uh, we didn't know what to do. We were kind of like deer caught in headlights. Uh -huh. We just sort of stood there looking up. Uh, we we had actually started the night uh, uh, going to a double feature movie, uh, and and then had gone to the bar afterwards and had a few beers. So we were not completely intoxicated, but we we were not feeling any pain. Uh huh. Uh, but it it really surprised us. It it sobered us immediately to be standing on these sand dunes, uh, uh, on our way to our quarters, taking a shortcut to our quarters to uh, suddenly be illuminated by this uh, very large metallic craft. And uh, after a few seconds of being in this light, very strong light, the, uh, our perception was the light winked out. And as our eyes were adjusting, the UFO kind of shot away and disappeared over the horizon. Um, in, in retrospect, when I look back on it, it's very possible that it actually could have just collapsed you know, down to a very small uh, point of uh, light or something, uh, you know, uh, and pulled is... it out of reality, so to speak. Oh, and gotcha. it would have maybe given the appearance of having shot away very quickly. But uh, so I, don't, I don't know. this was probably late 60s? Uh, this was in uh, uh, 1966 time okay. frame, uh, early 1966. And... Uh, we decided we went back to the bar, and we decided we didn't want to discuss it with anyone because mm -hmm. we were very, very pleased with being in uh, in the Bahamas and not in Southeast Asia at the time. Uh huh. And uh, so we made a pact that we weren't going to mention this to anyone. Uh, unfortunately, the following morning, when we both were awakened, uh, we both had extremely bad sunburns. Uh, wow. He, in fact, was burned so badly. He was air evac to uh, Homestead Air Force Base in Florida. Wow. To the, uh, the Army Hospital there. I'm sorry, the Air Force Hospital there. And, uh, and I was uh, treated on, on uh, Eleuthera. I was not burned as badly uh, because I was uh, a diver, and so I had an extremely good tan. And that probably protected me from the, the UV rays. But uh, he was burned pretty good. Uh, and they, of course, asked us how it happened, and we told them uh, what occurred. Uh, and they, of course, uh, did not write that down anywhere. They said that uh, they weren't going to make a silly report like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting about it is, uh, in retrospect, I went and checked with the downrange tracking systems that we had on Eleuthera that were part of the Cape Canaveral tracking system, and uh, they informed me that almost everything, every piece of equipment they had in telemetry and radar, et cetera, had been uh, whited out for an approximate eight-minute period uh, when that occurred. So uh, there was a huge energy output that occurred at the same time. Now, in retrospect, given all of your experiences, what is your perception of what happened there? Why why this happened? Well, it, it's it's obvious to me that in order to in order to travel star to star or planet to planet, um, it's it's not going to be done with a fire wagon. It's uh, it's going to be go it's going to be done with a vehicle that has the capacity or the capability to fold in and out of space time. Uh, in, in other words, we're going to be dealing 
with aliens that use time machines. And uh, by virtue of the fact that they can disappear at one star and reappear in another, uh, in other words, make the trip in a very rapid way or using a very rapid methodology, uh, they have to be time machines, uh, violate time space. Uh, if that's the case, then it opens an entire uh, plethora of possibilities in terms of what aliens might be. Uh, they, they could, in fact, be um, ourselves visiting ourselves from the future. Uh, it could be a, uh, uh, a civilization that developed on Earth that might be visiting from the past. Or it could be uh, true alien uh, creatures that have no uh, no consensus with us in any subject area. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we just don't know. It, it could also be that it's a uh, uh, that they hail from a uh, another universe completely, uh, uh, kind of a, a multi-dimensional uh, place, other than. Where we where we reside in terms of physics, so mm -hmm. it uh, opens up a lot of questions. Yeah. So this was the beginning of your military career, and then years later, more than a decade later, uh, as your career is burgeoning, uh, you come back to America, and you become remote viewer number one. How did you find out about this program, and how did you feel about being recruited into it? Well, the, that, that, that's, those are all very good questions because if someone had actually walked me into a room and said, we think you're psychic, uh -huh. uh, would you volunteer for this program? I would have said, what are you, out of your gourd? Uh -huh. uh, if, if someone had said, you know, everybody who thinks they're psychic in the room, raise your hands. And it, it, you know, we all knew that if we had raised our hands, our careers would have died on the spot. <laughs> and, you know, our clearances would have disappeared and, and we, of course, would have been cooks or bottle washers or something the next day. But uh, the, the way it actually happened is uh, they, they were a lot more nefarious. When I say they, the mm. intelligence people, were a little more nefarious in their search for psychics uh, within the Army. Uh, they chose us by, dis by uh, uh, bringing us into a room and challenging us with uh, a lot of paranormal uh, material. Uh, reports in newspaper articles and things, uh, some of which were classified at the time, and asked us how we felt about these things and did we think that uh, having absolutely no knowledge about any of those things was it could be or was a threat to the United States. And of course, I, uh, after reviewing the material they presented me with, I had to respond truthfully and say that I felt it was a great threat to the United States, having it, for us to have no knowledge of you know what was behind these kinds of phenomena. I felt would be uh, a tremendous threat, especially if another country had a capacity or a capability that we didn't possess. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, as a result, I was sent uh, to see some people where I was interviewed. And they felt that uh, I should go to SRI International on the West Coast and be tested. And I agreed to do that, thinking uh, there's probably not a, you know, not a way, not a way that I could be involved in this. And on arrival at SRI, I turned. Uh, it turned out that in my six double-blind remote viewing tests, I had five uh, perfect results and one near-perfect wow. result. Wow. Wow. So and that's I the was, Stanford Research Institute. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I was subsequently volunteered uh, and became part of the Stargate Project. It's now known as the Stargate Project. So that was uh, quite a process, and you were very successful at it. Uh, yeah, I was uh, the first one recruited. I was a remote viewer 001. You know, a license to kill. No, no, not really. But, <laughs> you know, um, I did get the number one since I was the first recruited. And then when they realized if they gave 002 to the next remote viewer they recruited, they'd be telling everyone how many remote viewers they had. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so the next viewer got 382 or 385 or something like that. Uh, so I turned out to be the only double zero uh, You're remote the only viewer. Double O um, agent. Right. It was, of course, there's no significance to that at all. Uh -huh. um, there were six of us recruited in the original group. Uh, I believe 
uh, three or three survive today, and uh, out of those uh, six, we were all uh, individually felt uh, the military felt that uh, all six of the original viewers were exceptionally good viewers. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, that's how it proved down anyway in the, the course of our uh, our ability to uh, respond to specific taskings and missions of all the intelligence agencies in America. Mm-hmm. Was this pretty shocking to you? I mean, it seems especially, you know, late 70s, you know, not too far from Vietnam, certainly on, on people's minds, uh, a lot going on, uh, and a very conservative type of, of period of time, and all of a sudden there's this, there's this psychic program going on. Well, yeah, it, it, was, it was a very conservative period, and, uh, in, but within the context of that, uh, we were being tasked with some very real-world problems, uh, everything from uh, uh, missing fighter bombers to uh, to agents or to kidnap generals to uh, terrorist organizations, and uh, and and we were tasked double-blind on these things, and were able to, in effect, provide sufficient information to. Uh, rescue people who were being uh, otherwise tortured. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were able to locate and find things that other agencies spent uh, literally uh, dozens of months looking for and were unable to find. Uh, We would, uh, for instance, the bomber that went down over Africa, uh, the uh, CIA and a number of other agencies looked for that plane for uh, well over a year and were unable to come up with any data. Mm-hmm. And we found the plane in four hours. So uh, it turned out that the applications of remote viewing within the, the at least the purview of the intelligence uh, agencies was of extreme value to the government. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe you can explain to people what double blind is, and maybe a little bit about the process. Yes, it, it it's what makes remote viewing uh, significantly different from just psychic functioning. Um, psychic functioning is someone who uh, may get insight to something uh, by uh, ha- by you know just popping up with information, uh, having information just pop into their mind while they're discussing perhaps a murder case or something. Uh, but it, but in most cases they do know something about what it is they're looking at. Uh, they may have some details about the murder case, that kind of thing. Uh, in, in, at the time, the single greatest uh, deficiency in using psychics was the fact that you had to front load them, that you would give them information, and in many cases they would just sort of regurgitate that information back to you in a different package. And, uh, and so uh, to show that it was really psychic information, uh, remote, the protocol for remote viewing was invented by SRI International, where uh, they uh, would task a psychic with producing information, but would maintain that psychic in a double blind, in a double blind uh, uh, scenario. In other words, the psychic would be taken into a room. Uh, he would be sitting at a in an empty table in an empty room, and um, uh, a person would come in with an envelope, say a double wrapped opaque envelope which would have nothing written on it, and they would drop it on the counter, and, and they would say, tell me what I need to know about what's in the envelope. Basically, mm-hmm. neither that person nor anyone else in the room with the psychic at the time would have any information that was pertinent to the target. So it, it, the idea was that it would force the psychic to actually use the psychic ability to, uh, to obtain any information at all about the target. Uh, what's astounding is that in most cases, uh, I say most cases, and at least 50% of the occasions it was used, uh, the psychic would produce pertinent information that was of uh, very good value or uh, at least uh, uh, important value to the uh, subsequent solving of the problem. Mm-hmm. Now, one of your books, um, your uh, handbook, uh, I read, and I know... You uh, talked a lot about the importance of feedback. 
Um, yes. Mm-hmm. And practicing, uh, kind of. Uh, could you explain that? Yeah, uh, but pra- practicing remote viewing is extremely important because uh, it, it, basically uh, every human being, we know that every human being thinks differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are all brought up differently. We all have different experiences. So our minds all work differently. And the way we frame information in our minds and use it is completely different, one from the, the next person. So uh, you can't generally make a statement that says uh, uh, only, uh, only this kind of information will occur with, uh, with someone at this particular point in thinking. Uh, you have to allow that, uh, that all kinds of possible information may pop up in somebody's mind. Um, the idea about being psychic is is not so much the information popping up in the mind, but the ability to uh, to understand the symbology of that information. What mm. what does it mean when you get the image of a swimming pool, for instance? Does it doesn't it almost never means that there's a swimming pool at the target, but what it will mean is that there's a a large containerized area, perhaps some fluid that might be in the target area. Mm-hmm. And, and so you have to try to interpolate uh, how, how those symbolic uh, pictures and, and things are, are popping into the mind. Uh, everybody does that differently. Uh, so, so the rules can't be hard and fast. Uh, the only rules that you can really make about remote viewing is don't jump to conclusions. Uh, don't uh, try to identify specifically what it is you're talking about. Just try to give the barest facts, the minimum facts that come into the mind. Uh, in many cases, people are able to do that, and in some cases, they're not. Uh, the way, the only way to discern whether or not somebody is a world-class psychic or a world-class remote viewer is to have them actually do it. And in order for them to become good at it, they have to practice it in a repeatable, uh, repeatable uh, way. In other mm-hmm. words, uh, over and over and over until it becomes second nature. It's kind of like a mental muscle they have to exercise. Yeah, and, and you kind of learn how your muscle or your brain works that way then, huh? Exactly. And, and, and so it's, it's very hard. Uh, uh, another person can't say, uh, this this is a rule that's always uh, hard fast. You know, mm-hmm. uh, if you get an image of an inverted V, it always means a religious target. Well, no, not necessarily. It may it may be so for 63.5 percent of the population, but the other part of the population, the inverted V, is going to be meaningful for something else. So, mm-hmm. uh, it's only through practice that we can we can learn. Uh, the sort of this dynamic language of the mind, the uh, subconscious to the conscious mind, and uh, and that language is dynamic. It changes constantly, so uh, mm-hmm. practice is required. E- even if someone is a world-class remote viewer, they still have to practice on a regular basis or they lose it. And it makes sense, because then you can learn how to also translate. Because like, like you said, if there's a pool, then you can write maybe, because uh, I've taken some... Uh-huh. Some of the courses and stuff and seeing how different people would do it. If you write water or fluid, uh, container, as opposed to pool, then when you find out what the target is, you can see maybe it was a glass of water or... Yeah, it, even more importantly, um, if, you're, if you are putting down the details, like uh, uh, cube, ground level, uh, f- contains fluid... Uh, fluid flows a certain direction, mm. that kind of thing, uh, then when that information is married up with other intelligence information, say an overhead satellite photograph or uh, maybe two or three reports from some on-site agents, then that information may imply that there is an underground element to the target that no one knows about. And then mm-hmm. uh, they can take adequate steps to retarget using uh, the kinds of uh, implementation or implements that might provide the specific information that you're looking for about the underground portions of the target, that kind of thing. That's, mm-hmm. It's never used alone. It's always used in conjunction with other intelligence, uh, intelligence information. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it can prove of extreme value that way. Yeah. 
and and it, which makes sense because a lot of people, unfortunately, are kind of out there, uh, uh, quote unquote, remote viewing and uh, unknown targets, and then they do talks about how they've discovered what's on the moon and who makes crop circles and all of these. Yeah, things. And it, it, you can't really do that. You, you have mm-hmm. to be able to. You have to be able to have some. You have to have something that you can compare the information to, uh, that you can validate the information with. Uh, There's many techniques and methodologies for doing that. Uh, It takes a lot of time sometimes to build target information or a library of information about a target to the point that you can extrapolate uh, extrapolate, um, uh, sufficient information of value. Um, it, it, all of these are also bits and pieces of the techniques that are married into, uh, married up with uh, the actual remote viewing that makes remote viewing uh, a methodology that's worth using. Mm-hmm. Uh, people that don't understand all of these things or don't have the uh, the sufficient uh, man hours of research backing them up. Uh, you know, will usually fail in any efforts that they may may attempt. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to get to, I guess, uh, we haven't talked about Ingo Swan, who, and from what I understand, it was SRI who kind of uh, had him, since he was a known psychic, who I guess they were able to demonstrate uh, had a real ability. Uh, yeah. He, he helped them create the protocols. Uh, it, well, Ingo Swan uh, was a psychic in New York, and uh, he became known to uh, Dr. Uh, Hal Putoff, and uh, Dr. Putoff brought him to SRI uh, to study him, and he became more than just a guinea pig or a subject. He became a partner in the research and uh, helped, helped to develop some of the, uh, the remote viewing protocol. Um, uh, it, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, things about remote viewing uh, are a direct result of some of the things that Ingo Swan did. Um, for instance, uh, in the beginning they used outbounders. That's where they sent people to the actual target sites and targeted the people. Uh, of course, that would have been very difficult if you're looking at a, a Russian uh, classified area you would have to find someone who had access to that area and target them. Uh, they found that to be very difficult, so Ingo said, well, what we can do is we can use uh, coordinates, you know, geographic coordinates uh, for the targeted area. And that seemed to work very well. Uh, the CIA, of course, balked at that. Uh, they came around the, the first five months I was a viewer uh, working for the agency, they balked at the fact that their targets were being given to me in geographic coordinates. And uh, so we said, well, that's, that's fine. We understand. You think Joe has a photographic memory and he's memorized the world. Well, that's, that's fine. Why don't you put the geographic coordinates in a double-wrapped, opaque, sealed envelope, and we'll just ask Joe to report on what he finds important at whatever location is identified inside the envelope. And that worked just as well. So... Uh, you know, we went, we made the leap very quickly into sealed envelopes. Um, it, it, the, the process is really driven by two things. Um, intent, that's the, the operational intent of the people making or inventing the target, uh, what their intention is, what they, and their expectation for outcome. If you have an intention to penetrate the underground area of an ICBM site, and you have the expectation that you will produce valuable information about that site, then that's precisely what the remote viewer will do. Uh, how the target is identified within the envelope is really not very material. Uh, it's that intention and expectation that gets the viewer to the target. Interesting. And mm-hmm. then uh, early on, getting on to kind of back to the UFOs, I. UFOs, surprisingly, uh, when I was, you know, reading about remote viewing, uh, became kind of a fairly common type of thing. Uh, I, I think every remote viewer I've read about has had some sort of experience um, looking at this sort of thing. And I think even Ingo Swan had an unexpected um, run-in when they, at the beginning of the program, mm-hmm. uh, when they were trying to remote view a, 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 a submarine. Uh-huh. They, uh, they're... 
Uh, there's some interesting things about UFOs. Uh, uh-huh. Throughout the history of the program, uh, there, of course, was a great deal of interest in UFOs. So there was a lot of targeting of the remote viewers on UFOs. Um, I have to say, however, that uh, almost all the targeting of UFOs was uh, not at the bequest of the government, but at the bequest of some of the other viewers. So mm-hmm. the, the viewers themselves were, uh, were setting up uh, blind targets for other viewers. Uh, they were not being told or knew that they were working actually on UFOs. Uh, during the history of the project, there was only one actual official viewing of a UFO, and that happened to be a, uh, a U.S. Air Force target, and I was asked to be the viewer on that particular project. Um, what, what actually had happened is they, uh, in using uh, some of the Air Force surveillance equipment to, uh, to photograph a target site in an Eastern Bloc country, they happened to capture an object at uh, about 14,000 feet in, in, in one of the photographs. And not knowing what it was, they sent uh, a negative of that wrapped in a double-wrapped opaque envelope to our, our office and asked us to target it. Um, I came up for targeting at that time and, uh, uh, and did some very nice drawings of the actual uh, the actual facility that they had been taking photographs of. Uh, while doing the drawings of that facility, uh, I happened to uh, state that I had a sense that something had just passed in front of my face, and they asked me, uh, the, the man who was sitting with me, uh, thought that maybe I had seen the uh, fast mover or the, the vehicle that had actually taken the photographs. And he thought, oh, that would be really neat if Joe could draw a picture of this uh, classified fast mover. Mm -hmm. And so he asked me if I would draw it, and I said, certainly. And after a few minutes of concentration, I ended up drawing uh, an oblique uh, circle on the page and uh, filling it in as a uh, what apparently was a a saucer-shaped craft. Uh, I said the craft was at approximately 13,000 feet and was traveling at 14,000. I'm sorry, traveling at 4,000 miles per hour, and had just finished making a hard right-hand turn, 90-degree turn, uh, in in uh, in that photograph. And in fact, in three frames of the photographs, it did make a 90-degree right turn it was estimated to be traveling at approximately 3,900 miles per hour, and it was traveling at about 11,000 feet. So uh, that data alone was verified by the, the analysis of the photo. Uh, and there was uh, some other information that, uh, that I provided, which uh, I can't share, but was mm-hmm. a, a very interesting target to do. Wow, how did they react to that? Uh, well, that, that's an interesting story in itself. I, um, having the clearances and whatnot, I immediately uh, typed out a request for my own copies of the photo and sent it into the system. And uh, when, I, uh, when that uh, floated around out there for about 10 days, I got a message to report to the uh, commanding general and the uh, my commanding general told me that uh, he wanted to know, and the uh, military, let's uh, see, it was the Naval Intelligence Service at the time, NIS, who was specifically charged with protecting those photographs. They wanted to know why I had asked for copies of the uh, the photographs that were missing from that, that particular file. Uh, so I was never able to get copies of the photograph. And they were pretty hot about finding out why I was asking for for photos that turned up to be missing. Uh, wow. Yeah, it turned into a uh, uh, a more complicated situation than I had expected. So I guess just to get an idea, because this is so interesting how the group worked. I mean, it was set up 
when you started, I mean, was there a period of uh, to get things rolling, the whole department rolling, was there training uh, for you and the rest of the group, and how long did that last? Uh, yeah, uh, it, initially it was going to be a, uh, a study project. We were going. Uh -huh. We we knew that the uh, at the time we were at war in, in a cold war with the Soviet Union, and we knew that uh, uh, through our own nefarious ways that the Soviet Union was using psychics to target uh, to target us, and we had no idea how effective that was. And, but it bothered us that we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so a suggestion was made that the way to find out, since we can't get someone into the Soviet psychic program, uh, the way we would do it is we would uh, spend a three-year period studying uh, how, how they did exactly what they did. We would use the first year to recruit and train our own psychics uh, exactly the way the Russians were being used. Uh, then we would spend the second year, we would send those recruits out into the world, and, and those, uh, would, we would target uh, things we knew about, like the FBI or the CIA or the White House, that kind of thing. And then at the end of the second year, we would take all the materials that we collected psychically and turn, that o turn those materials over to a independent agency who would evaluate the results and say, oh, well, this is approximately how good you did, so this is probably how good the Russians do. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we would have some ground truth about, you know, their ability. Well, as it turned out, uh, no one knew what training meant, so uh, we were pretty much just uh, practicing remote viewing. We did have the basic protocol for remote viewing down, so we were doing practice runs with, uh, with targets, local targets like airfields and fire stations and things like that. And uh, about three months in, uh, we had the Iran, Tehran hostage problem where our embassy was taken over. And they, of course, had no way of monitoring what was going on inside the embassy. Uh, they asked a number of us to, uh, they woke us up in the middle of the night before anyone in America knew that the embassy had been taken over, and they asked us to, uh, they told us that an embassy somewhere in, Amer somewhere in the world had been uh, taken over by terrorists, and we were asked to identify by photograph uh, the people who were uh, kept as hostages because it had been taken over on a Sunday, so nobody knew who was a hostage and who wasn't. Um, we identified, I think it was 64 people at the time, uh, actually did some pencil sketches of three of the people because uh, there was no photo for them. It turns out that those three people were later identified as CIA agents that no one knew was in country. Mm -hmm. um, had we not drawn sketches of them, they probably would have died in captivity. Uh, it turned out our our accuracy was phenomenal in identifying the actual hostages. So as a result, uh, we we ceased being a uh, uh, a study group and were reoriented and reactivated as a active collection facility. And uh, and that was approved and financed on a year-to-year -year basis based on our abilities and, and what we were able to accomplish. And as a result, we existed for 20 years and provided intelligence to uh, every intelligence organization in America over that 20-year period, uh, to include five administrations in the White House, I would add. Wow. Do you know if that... The, did the White House itself like uh, come to you guys for, for for work? We we did we did work for the White House, the uh -huh. Secret Service, the FBI, CIA, DEA, DIA, NSA, uh, National Security Council, all the uh, intelligence agencies of the DOD, uh, to include the Coast Guard. Um, I mean, it was I can't think of a single intelligence organization that we didn't do work for. Wow. Were there some groups, I think I had read this, that came in and asked you to do work and you just you didn't know who they were? 
Uh, yes, there were some groups that did that uh, initially. Uh, initially, they had uh, a great deal of doubts about uh, psychic, the use of psychics. And mm -hmm. so they felt that even giving a hint as to what group may have tasked the material would be giving too much information. Uh -huh. So uh, we were asked to uh, demonstrate our abilities by uh, targeting information in sealed envelopes provided by totally unknown people. Uh, and in many cases, uh, oh, well, actually in all cases, we were able to do that, demonstrate that we were able to do that. Uh, in one case, I, w I was personally asked if I could uh, if I could track a human being, and I said yes. And so the agency, which I did not know at the time, uh, provided me with a three by five card with a single social social security number written on it, and I was told that that was the uh, the target individual. So I had no idea if it was a man, a woman, a child, or or what. Uh, or where in America they might be, and I was called randomly on three different occasions and asked to describe with detail exactly where they were, and on all three occasions that that specific spot in which they were standing was easily identifiable by my drawings. So uh, as a result, we got a lot more tasking from that specific agency. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you guys went on to train other uh, train other groups? Well, it, that's not entirely true. Okay. Uh, there was an attempt there was an attempt made to train uh, remote viewers uh, to uh, there, there was some feeling Ingo Swan had some ideas that he could uh, put together a training mechanism whereby he could train uh, people who were uh, not psychic to be psychic mm -hmm. um, and uh, an attempt was made to do that it was a six stage training mechanism it, only the first three stages were trained over a period of 18 months and uh, what we wound up with was no significant improvement with any of the people that were being trained so it was terminated um, Subsequently, what we discovered, and that we discovered this through research, is that all human beings, uh, regardless of background, race, uh, place of birth, culture, or anything else, all human beings are psychic to some degree or another. That that degree of psychic ability uh, is differentiated by levels of personal talent, just like you would have someone who uh, had sufficient talent as a baseball player to end up in the National Baseball League. Uh, so it goes with psychics. There are some who have a natural ability or uh, a natural talent that can excel, and whereas most people don't. Most people are just naturally uh, psychic in a spontaneous way. That, you know, it happens once in a while. Yeah, we've we've done uh, you know uh, in the past and uh, years, I've been involved with a few different uh, things where with uh, remote viewing exercises and uh, with our MUFON in Colorado, there was one individual who was just really good at it. Definitely uh -huh. showed uh, that he was more accurate, much more so than than anybody else. Uh huh. Yeah, and and surprisingly. Uh, and this also from research, I can tell you that uh, if you were to stand on any street corner in any random city on the planet and just randomly grab 200 people off the street, you would basically be grabbing one world-class psychic if in that mm. 200. Wow. So that, that's a lot of world-class psychics out there. Right. And so somebody would say, well, uh, wh wh where are they? You know, that's 400,000 in America alone. Where are they? Well, they're the stockbroker who's who's making the right guess on what investment to make 68% mm -hmm. of the time or better. Uh, they are the surgeon who intuitively does exactly the right thing when seconds are involved in saving a life. Um, they're the painter who uh, has incredible skill at bringing paintings to life. Uh 
that's who these people are. Yeah, makes sense. Now, the media kind of portrays that uh, Project Stargate was closed down because it wasn't effective, which kind of doesn't make sense. Why would the program last so long if it wasn't effective? And uh, that doesn't seem to be accurate. Is that well, I got a, I, I was awarded a Legion of Merit um, by the Secretary of the Army mm-hmm. um, for my, uh, for providing, uh, basically, uh, I provided uh, standalone intelligence of national interest or higher uh, in over 160 missions as wow. a remote viewer. Um, I will tell you that as an intelligence officer, I, who spent uh, nearly 14 years overseas. Um, in that entire 14 years, I was only able to produce a single intelligence first. In that entire time of six and a half years before I retired from the Army, I was able to do that over 160 times as a remote viewer. So you, you do the math. Mm-hmm. Um, that That's a phenomenal success as a as a uh, intelligence officer. So, uh, yeah, it's true. It's very low percentages. Our success rate was somewhere between 18 and 20 percent. But the difficulty is you have to look at what we were tasked with. The 18 and 18 to 20 percent or 18 to 22 percent success rate we had was with targets that no other agency could find a solution for. Mm-hmm. We didn't even get them until many of those agencies had worked those problems for one or more years. They were dumped in our lab, and we were able to solve 22% of them, and that's a very low percentage, true, but we were able to solve 22% of those within hours. Mm-hmm. I think that's significant. Right. I mean, even if you consider a, a police work, you know, if you have, you're able to resolve just by... Uh, Using these 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 methods, twenty percent of your cold cases, that's better than not solving them. Oh, that's or, incredible! That's that's right. absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. There are there are police. I know there are police departments who would build whole departments that could do that if they could do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, and, and there are some other area, other things about remote viewing that are not as commonly known or as well known uh, that that make it even, you know, more important. Uh, as an example, uh, nuclear targets, for example, uh, uh, remote viewers almost, at least some remote viewers, almost never miss a nuclear target. Uh, so if you're, if you're looking for where's the nuke, you know, uh, which shell is the nuke hidden under, well, you want a remote viewer looking for it because the remote viewer almost never misses that question. Wow. So when it comes to your talk at MUFON uh, with UFOs and extraterrestrials, is it your remote viewing of UFOs uh, giving you the insight uh, that you're using for this talk? It's given me a considerable amount of insight, in fact. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of the insi- insight I'm using to address some of the problems uh, that we may face if we were to come in full contact with aliens. And that's kind of the gist of my presentation. Um, I'm going to speak directly to, uh, first, what I, what I know to be true uh, based on remote viewing and what I think we could expect based on remote viewing. So what those, are some of those things that you know to be true? Well, I'd be giving it away. You need to come to the MUFON conference to find out. Hmm. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, but you you got to give them a, a little hint so they can be like, oh, wow, this is great. i got to go. Well, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot said, for instance, about, you know, almost, almost everyone that has some kind of direct alien contact uh, experience uh, deals with the large dark eyes and the uh, the feature almost featureless face, and I can tell you from remote viewing that the reason for that is because uh, all aliens wear what I would call a skin suit. It's a very uh, it's a very form fitted 
uh, environmental suit, which is used to protect their uh, their senses, their uh, smell, taste, touch, uh, sight, everything about how they are influenced by our reality. Um, the, for instance, the eyes have to be covered because many of the uh, the biologic uh, threats that they would be facing within our our uh, our environment uh, would be uh, da- very damaging to them through the through the eyes through the mm-hmm. mucus of the eyes. So they they were they were these environmental suits, and the environmental suits are are not meant to hide them. It's it's meant to protect them and to give them some some edge over uh, over their normal uh, ability when they're in within our environment within their when they're within our uh, uh, bright sun, our our you know our starry night, so to speak, versus mm-hmm. theirs. Kind of a, a super advanced spacesuit. Yeah, and and the the other difficulty is uh, catching them out outside of one of those environmental suits. Uh, that does occasionally occur, uh, but it occurs when they're within their own protected environment, which is their ship. Mm-hmm. Or their vehicle. Uh, the vehicle is not particularly well suited for deep space travel, but then it doesn't have to do deep space travel. It only has to do a uh, fold in and out uh, through time space. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but the but the inside of their vehicle does protect them does protect them to a great extent from the uh, the multivariant. Uh, uh, diseases and uh, viruses and things that we have on our planet that they would become very quickly victim to. Mm-hmm. Now I've heard that you've done some some help with uh, crash retrieval type of work. Uh, do you believe that uh, their craft have uh, crashed on occasion? Yes, um, I believe they have. Uh, here, here's uh, here's some facts that that I know from hands-on. Uh, I've been to at least 12 uh, known crash sites where many people believe UFOs have crashed. Only one of those actual crash sites do I believe an alien vehicle crashed. Hmm. Uh, there is substantial evidence uh, through investigation or post-investigation that many of those crashes were our own vehicles or vehicles of our own creation. Does and, that include uh, Roswell? Pardon? Does that include Roswell? I don't think a crash happened at Roswell. I think okay. that's a uh, watch the birdie uh, thing. It's it, it's interesting to me that every time uh, every time serious discussion begins uh, surrounding the uh, oh, I'm not going to remember it now the crash in the, in in uh, um, uh, there was another area in Me- Mexico. Uh, where the Roswell one happened, or a different crash? No, it's a different crash site entirely. Um, uh, I can't. It, you have to forgive me. I can't remember oh, the no site. Oh no problem. There's like Pines of Augustine and Sakura. Yeah, and, but but whenever a serious Rona. discussion arises about that particular crash site, mm-hmm. all of a sudden Roswell pops up, and everybody starts discussing Roswell again, mm-hmm. and the Air Force starts passing out information. And there's all kinds of stuff about Roswell. And I think Roswell is a, uh, a dis- distractor. It's meant to distract us from the actual crash site. Aztec, was it maybe? Huh? Aztec? No, no, it's a different one than that. Oh, but, okay. Uh, so it could uh, be distracting I have it in my us notes from the real one. Yeah, uh, from the actual the actual event that's of importance. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the other thing uh, which is interesting to me is the... Uh, uh, it's very difficult, for instance, uh, targeting targeting an alien craft. It's very difficult in the first place because uh, I think they have a, a very clear sense of when they're being targeted psychically. Hmm. Uh, so uh, a psychic is generally given something to keep them busy. Uh, in my case, I've, they continually give me boxes within boxes. So, uh, for instance, I started out with an, with a uh, uh, sort of an impression of uh, 
uh, in kind of a Y, three lines all intersecting. And uh, it took, took six months for me to figure out that what I was seeing was the inside of an empty corner of a box or an empty box, uh, the inside corner of an empty box. And uh, so, so they do things that, that uh, are kind of like, you know, hand the kid a rattle and maybe he'll right. get involved and, uh-huh. and be distracted. So uh, uh, there, are, there are ways around that, and the ways around it are to uh, target, target things where they don't expect you to be. Hmm. And that would be at some of the sites in which uh, alien vehicles might be spotted. Uh, in all of the tens of thousands of sightings, uh, in order to target one that actually has real aliens involved in it, that's a pretty daunting task. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, wh- wh- which ones are for real and which ones aren't. So, uh, preliminarily speaking, uh, remote viewing can be used to sort of weed out the the less uh, the less real from the real. Gotcha. Uh, and then once you've done that, then you can sort of get down to business and target real sites and and get more information. And that uh, one of the twelve sites where you believe it was a, a real crash, um, why did the object crash? Uh, the object crashed because it collided with another vehicle with a mm. plane, and the plane the plane basically augured in and and, and exploded on the desert floor. This is in 1950, and the actual vehicle itself, uh, it was witnessed by two miners, and the vehicle itself skipped along the ground like a Frisbee. It actually ricocheted off the ground two or three times before coming to rest uh, nose first into the side of a uh, a hard rock uh, kind of mesa. And if you go there today, you can actually see the imprint of the circular outer edge of the oblique oblique vehicle, uh, just as it just as it had been impacted into the side, and you can see where the stone has been blasted away in all directions, and uh, and then you can see the actual heavy track marks of the military vehicles that came in to remove the vehicle from the area. Uh, of course, they're much well printed in the area nearer to the crash than they are where they were just simply driven in off the, the tractor trailers. Um, but, it, but the evidence is still there. It's the middle mm-hmm. of a desert where it never rains, and, and, uh, and you can still see the mining equipment and, and the digging equipment and buckets and things that the miners had. So, uh, you know, all the facts add up, and, uh, except there's nothing there. Uh, but it, but it's a very real sight for me because it feels different from the the other sites which uh, don't seem to be a hundred percent. They never seem to be quite a hundred percent. Is this a well known uh, crash or a one maybe that's in uh, Ryan Wood's book? Uh, it's I will tell you it's in Ryan Wood's book. Uh huh. <laughs> Did he write about your uh, experiences with that in the book? I'm not. I'm not going to say one way or the other because I haven't. Okay. I haven't. Uh, I don't know which one we're talking about. So. Okay. It, gotcha. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That sounds pretty interesting. I know in the '50s too. I was reading in um, Jim Mars' book that you had remote viewed a UFO mass sighting in Tacoma, Washington. That's correct. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. Yeah, and. Yeah. Uh, I I was targeted on a mountain near Tacoma, Washington, because everyone thought there was an alien base, an underground alien base there. And uh, but what, in fact, I found was, uh, and, and did actual drawings of, turned out to be very accurate drawings. Uh, when I did the drawings, everybody said, oh, that's got to be an alien base. Uh, nothing like that ever existed on the Earth. Mm-hmm. And, and many years later, I think 12 years later, what it's turned out to be is an over-the-horizon radar site. Yeah. And it, of course, was a top-secret facility for 20 years because no one knew you could look over the horizon with radar because it's line of sight. So uh, my drawings are very accurate, though, for the, uh, for the actual site itself, the facility itself. So 
there are bizarre things uh, that you do pick up on that you can see and say, oh, those have got to be alien. That can't, can't possibly be uh-huh. us, uh, when in fact it is us, and we just don't know about the technology. I think my last question will be, um, do you think there are, uh, the Stargate program prob- could have continued but uh, gone even more clandestine? No, I don't think it has. Uh, I'd know, right? Uh, <laughs> um I, I don't think it has, and the reason I don't think it has is uh, even when it was operational, we had as many distractors as we had friends. Uh, it was going going to work every day was like a knife fight in a phone booth. You d- <laughs> didn't know who your friends were, or who your enemies were, um, and it, it, it's just too big a uh, a target. Uh, any politician involved would have their careers ruined over it because. Uh, they were believing, uh, end quote, in that psychic, that funky psychic stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, generals uh, were put off by it because uh, nobody, nobody in their sane or right mind would buy into that stuff, that kind of thing. Uh, but on the other hand, we had some very powerful senators and some very, uh, very interesting operational people down at the, uh, down at the uh, agent level who believed very, very much in what we were doing and used our information all the time. So, uh, no, I don't, I, don't think, uh, I don't think it continued. I think it was ended. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, really intriguing. I'm very excited to hear your talk and move on. I hope I can catch it. If not, I'm definitely going to get the DVD. Uh, all right. Definitely, definitely be there. It'll be fun. Yeah, I'll I suggest there. everybody come and enjoy it. And then your website's mceagle.com? That's correct. All right. We'll mceagle.com. Great. Is there anything else you wanted to share with listeners? No, no. Uh, just come to the event and uh, hear, hear my talk. It'll be fun. All right. Great. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a nice day. All right. You will be able to see Mr. McMoneagle and myself and... Some other of our Open Minds peeps at the event he was talking about, which is the MUFON Symposium, in July 29th through the 31st in Irvine, California. So that's going to be a lot of fun. MUFON.com to find out more about that. And as you heard in the interview, uh, Joe does have a website and several books. Very, very interesting stuff, especially if you are interested in remote viewing and how to do it yourself, or at least see if you have uh, any uh, abilities that way. You can uh, read some of his books. And that handbook that he talked about, the uh, handbook for remote viewing that he did, is very helpful, especially for getting to the details and the things like the feedback like he talked about and the exact protocols and really what they did to do what they do. But as he says, you know, you really got to be able to Know if you're accurate or not and find that out. And uh, one of the coolest remote viewing exercises that I've done and, and remote viewing classes do is you just get some pictures and you can get together some friends and maybe put some pictures on your laptop. And, of course, you as a facilitator wouldn't be able to participate. Um, but uh, then you get these pictures on your laptop and you have people do remote view and, you know, get a book or something so you can know the protocols When they do those protocols, don't show them the picture, of course, and then display the picture and see how accurate people were describing uh, the picture that they're going to see. And you'll have some amazing results, and you'll find there are some consistencies where some people are better at it than others. So it's very interesting, and it's a lot of fun to do. We're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us on Open Minds Radio. Next week, I'm not quite sure who we're going to have. I'm shuffling around a few people. Definitely going to have Ted Loader either either next week or the next, and he's a Ph.D. um, who talks about the physics of UFOs and things like that. Um, And I'm talking to astronaut Story Musgrave, who had his own UFO sighting, and it talks about UFOs and stuff. And so I have been talking to him. He's a busy guy, so hopefully we'll uh, be able to get some time from him. So we got a, a couple exciting interviews coming up and you'll have to wait and check out our website in the next couple days we'll post 
who will be next week. But we'll be here with the show, and it'll be a great guest. So don't forget to be here yourself. Thanks for listening to Open Minds Radio. Don't forget to visit openminds.tv for more UFO news. And we will talk to you next week, people. Adios. Have a good week.